Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's exciting webinar. I am Tim Stark and the host of today's exciting event. I'm a professor of civil engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the technical director of the Fabricated Geomembrane Institute, or FGI. This is our fifth webinar of 2020, and the remaining eight webinars for 2020 have already been scheduled with great speakers and timely topics, and I'll show you our next uh, webinar presentation on the last slide today. During today's webinar, we welcome questions and comments at any time. You can type those into the questions box in the control panel, and these can come in at any time, and Matt, our speaker today, will address them at the end of his presentation. The recording of this webinar and a PDF of the slides will be made available on the FGI website after today's presentation. PDH certificates will be sent automatically to all who attend the entire webinar. Today's webinar speaker is Matthew Chemnitz. Matt is the president of Leak Location Services, Inc. in San Antonio, Texas. LLSI has surveyed over a half a billion square feet of geomembrane at almost 4,000 pro project sites all over the world. This vast experience of performing leak location surveys at sites ranging in size from one acre to over 200 acres has provided Matt with valuable training to understand all aspects of leak location survey methods. The title of Matt's webinar today is Understanding Leak Location Surveys for Owners and Inspectors. Matt, thanks for squeezing this webinar into your busy schedule and joining us from San Antonio, Texas today. The webinar controls are yours. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, the rest of FGI. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I want to thank everybody for showing up to listen in on this. It looks like there's a, a good amount of interest. And so my point today is to try to get a good basic understanding of leak location surveys, what to look for, what to expect when you see one done, and just kind of give you an overall insight. But again, if there's more questions, please feel free to ask uh, at a later date or at the end of this, this uh, webinar here. So a little basics to kind of get the, get the groundwork laid. Many sites can require a, a liner or a geomembrane. Wastewater sites, power plants, landfills, the mining industry, oil and gas, power, agriculture. There's a lot of different uses for these liners and also a lot of situations where these liners can leak and cause some pretty bad uh, problems and some costly problems at that. So the idea of a geomembrane is simply put to keep liquids or whatever they're containing from going into the environment. Sometimes these liquids are bad and you don't want them in there. Sometimes these what's being contained is pricey and wants to be held on to. But the whole idea is to keep whatever is in there in there and not outside the liner. And how do they get out? Well, it's proper weld seams and holes in the geomembrane somewhere in the panel. So my first couple of pictures here, just gonna show you the liner seams. And the reason I'm gonna touch with liner seams first is because this is FGI and a lot of these seams, they can leak. This site here is in South Africa and you can tell there's multiple, multiple seams on this site. So the chances of some kind of issue with these seams, especially in this kind of environment, is pretty high. But if you're building a liner in a controlled environment, such as a fabricated gem membrane, the chances are next to nothing that there will be a hole in that liner. Now this next slide, some of y'all might see a, an issue right away. Of course, there's the seam, but then there's also a large pile of rock right on top of the liner. And these are the kind of things that you will see or that we see many times. This is an 80 acre cell here in the, in the US. And when we saw this from the client, we thought right away, there's gonna be a lot of damage on this liner. 
the seams on this site were good, but the damage was everywhere just because there was no fabric placed down. So the way people test seams, and, and I, don't, I don't test seams other than leak location surveys, but there's a destructive test and the percentage is pretty low on how much of the actual seam is being tested. A vacuum test, this is how much, uh, sorry, a percentage of the actual liner, the whole system is being tested, not, not just the seams. And then there's the air pressure test, which accounts for about 1% of the entire site. So these percentages are, are very low. However, if you're going to test those seams those same ways, because I, th I think they're great and they're good to be tested, but on top of that, to do another test on the entire cell, this includes the seams over. These are the four types of surveys that I'm gonna cover today and, and give you some insight in how we test the entire liner this is a bare liner method, or some people may call it a water puddle or squeegee. There's the water survey method, and this covers shallow water and deep water. There's the soil survey method, which is most of the surveys that are done. And then there's a leak monitoring system, which is, is not used very often, um, but it is put into cells that want to be continually tested throughout the lifetime of the site. So, let me start with an ASTM. This one's 6747. And actually it's on version 15 right now. So this one has been has been changed quite a bit. And the idea of this guide is to help you select the right type of survey from the ones I just showed you earlier to test your site. If it's covered with water or soil or it's bare or you have certain things in your site that need to be looked at, this is meant to help you through that. Now, the best way to figure out how to test it is call somebody that does these surveys and say, here's my site, it's in the planning phases, here's what I'm thinking, here's what we need in it, how can we build it best so that we can test it with the best and the optimal results? But that is 6747. So when you're preparing a site to be tested, and ideally you would call well beforehand that it's being tested, you can take care of a lot of these issues right up front. When you're doing a survey, the biggest thing is isolation around the perimeter. And I'll show you some pictures of that and what that looks like. Because the whole idea of these tests is to try and control electricity, which is nearly impossible. So you want to find ways to keep the current that you're putting in your cell to stay in the cell and the current that's outside the cell to stay there. And the only way those two sets of currents will touch each other is through a leak and only a leak, no other grounding situations. Now on this list, I have the word sediment. This comes up when you're doing a water survey and you have three feet of sediment on top and you can't get in the pond to test that sediment keeps you further away from the liner so it reduces sensitivity. There's a way that you could take the sediment out or not have it in there when you're doing the test that'll make it a better test. Some grounding sources, and I'll show pictures of all these in a second, are aerators, there's pump houses, um, steel piping, pipes in there with water that connect one pond to another pond. All these things can conduct the current and take it away from leaks that are in your site. Concrete pads, leachate pumps, all these are, are large issues that you see quite often. So on the first one for soil surveying, and this is probably the most difficult to do after the fact and costly. If you're gonna survey inside the cell and you want to be able to control that current inside here, you want this dirt and this dirt to be separate. Otherwise, you have an electrode here and in the cell, it's gonna go the path of least resistance and go right outside the cell. The only way to keep it from doing that is to have bare liner in between. With that bare liner, since it's non-conductive, the current has no way of jumping over this edge and stays inside the site 
the more current that stays inside the site, the better the results and the smaller leaks you will find. If you think about doing an isolation after you've already built the cell and somebody comes out to test and the results are not looking good, the artificial leak's not showing up, so we say, look, let's go ahead and give some isolation. You can do it and the results inside the cell will be good, but inside where he's digging this trench right here, you can imagine how many leaks are being made as he excavates that, that isolation strip. Now somebody comes in and they even dig it with the shovel, even that there's so many leaks caused. Sometimes it's better just to test it as is without that isolation because it causes much more damage than leaving it like it is. So if you think ahead and you know this is gonna be an issue, isolate your cell like on the previous slide and, and everything will be so much simpler for everyone. Now this site, this is the golf course pond. There's no isolation here. And there's not really a way to isolate it because they're not gonna wanna tear up their grass and expose the liner behind that rock. And I totally get it, I understand. In this case, this water here is much less conductive than the sand and the rock outside. So the good thing is, yes, you can still find leaks, but you're not gonna find the small leaks. But this golf course pond, that wasn't an issue. They wanted to find the large damage so they wouldn't lose so much water and the, the pinhole leaks were was, was just secondary. So rather than tear up their pond, they left it as is, tested as is, leaks are still found, but you're not gonna find all your leaks and you're definitely not gonna get to a zero leak type of situation here. Here's some grounding examples. On this top left one, you have a concrete pad. Now this concrete pad is laid right on top of earth ground, and then the liner is batten stripped around the perimeter. If you're doing what we call a bare liner test, you can test up to a few inches away from this pad to check for leaks, but any closer than that, it's gonna be difficult. Even if you had what they call a spark test, you can only get so close and then that pad will start conducting. And that's, that's the best case scenario when a site has concrete pads in it. You want to test it while it's empty. If you tested it while it was full, like one of these pictures over here on the right side, that grounded structure will act as a leak of that size. So you can imagine a leak that's three foot by three foot in size is going to take a lot of current into it. The more current you have going in to grounded structures or large leaks, the less current you have to go into the smaller leaks. So when the pond is full and you have a grounded structure, you either test it as is, but in this top right picture, you're only gonna be able to get 10 to 15 feet away from this to where your results are good anything closer it's going to it's going to see that large grounded structure as a leak so you will not be able to get any closer than that and this area will be the test will be inconclusive if you wanted to <clears throat> drop the water level then this would be removed from the the system and you'd be able to test for leaks but only the water covered area in this type of test is is checked for so if you have structures in your site, I would recommend dropping the water level and testing it with one of the bare liner methods rather than the water method, just so you have more of your current going into actual leaks and not, not the grounded structures. So on this slide here, just from the little bit that we've talked about already in grounding, you can probably already tell why this metal pipe is an issue. You can't see, but around the perimeter, there is bare liner exposed all the way around here, all the way around here, and then right here, there's a trench and there's bare liner. The problem is in this site, 
there's a big metal pipe going from the dirt inside the cell to the dirt outside the cell. And what that just did is made a leak the size of that pipe with the perfect conduit to pull all the current in the cell, outside of the cell, and to bypass every leak that was in that site. Now, a lot of these mistakes can be taken care of before we get to a site. If you call and you talk with the leak location contractor before they get out and you say, hey, here's a picture of my site. Do you see anything that could be causing an issue? Anybody would see this and say, you need to disconnect that pipe. You don't have to remove the entire pipe from the site. You just need to disconnect it where it covers the isolated part. Just connect it right here, this piece, and that, that'll take care of the situation. So there's so many sites that have different issues, but nothing better than just a quick phone call and a picture to get it set up before you get there. And it's a lot more effective and efficient that way. Here's another thing. When you're doing a bare liner test and there's some puddles in the, in the pond or some water, and we want it dry as you can be when you're doing a spark test or a bare liner test, you want it pretty dry. So if it rains the day before and you get a bunch of extra water puddles in your site, typically the contractor is going to want to throw a pump in there and pump the water out, which is great. However, we can't have that in the site while we're testing. Because if you can imagine coming along with your water puddle equipment or your spark tester, and you get up to this puddle here, <clears throat> and uh, bad idea if you have a spark tester and you get anywhere near water. It's That's just a no-go zone for that. But if you come up with your squeegee or bare liner or water puddle, and you touch this water here, that water puddle that has current in it is gonna go into this pipe, up this hose, and right outside the site. So this area right here is not testable with this pump in the way. This pump has to be turned off and removed because even though there's a little bit of water inside this hose, that current will still travel up the hose and out and cause a leak signal, even though it's not a leak. This isn't a big problem and it's easy to fix. You just take this pump out. But if this is, le is left in the site and you're doing a water survey with three feet of water or 10 feet of water, and this isn't noticed, even if it's turned off, that will still conduct current and show up as a signal. So even if the contractor marks this as a leak and you later drain the pond and you realize, oh, that was just a pump, it wasn't a leak, that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is that pump took current away from the entire system, away from possible actual leaks. So all of these things that I'm saying are best to do before they get out there, because you don't want to, after the fact, where current was going where it shouldn't, and making the entire survey less accurate than it could have been. So anything that you could think is grounding or give the person doing the test the entire story before they get there, they should be able to spot these things and you can remove them before they get outside. This side here um, is not testable as it stands. There's just, there's way too much going on. You've got aerators in the pond. You've got pipes on the surface. You've got metal cables holding everything in, in still. You've got metal pipes inside the pond, going outside the pond. There's, this thing is a small pond, but it's grounded everywhere. And so the problem with this is if you had a leak in here, even probably the size of a, of a trash can lid, you're not gonna see it because the current is not going in the water and it's definitely not going down to the bottom of the liner. It's going right outside one of these pipes or these wires. If we had seen a picture like this before we get to the site, there are a few things you can do to isolate things, such as these wires here at the ends, when they connect outside, you could wrap a little bit of liner or plastic around it 
to where it hooks onto the clamp and that will isolate it off. If you just put something non-conductive between the wire and the pipe that it's connected to outside, that'll take care of that situation. But the aerators, nine times out of 10, will have to be removed just because the equipment will get tangled up inside there. So again, pictures, plans, the whole idea, the whole story before we get out there, the better to test with. So this next slide, we're going to start talking about these different surveys uh, in a little more detail. This is, I'll admit, this is an older picture of uh, the equipment. <clears throat> but the idea is simple. He's got his squeegee apparatus, his handle, and his box. And it sprays out of these little nozzles some water. In the water goes right in front of this roller and it makes a puddle, which is why many people call it the water puddle method. He pushes that puddle with him as he goes. So the idea is if there's a leak on this liner, that puddle will go over the hole and it will complete the circuit because the water will fall into it. Then there's some pressure associated with this apparatus that pushes down the liner so small wrinkles can be flattened. So as he rolls over it, it completes the circuit, comes up this wire into his headphones, and he hears an audible tone right away. It goes from quiet to a beep right in his ear. He'll stop, he'll turn the water off, he'll mark it with a paint marker, and he'll keep going. This type of test is pretty fast. Um, it goes about four acres per day for one guy, and it takes about 2,000 gallons of water. To do that much space. Typically you'll find it in a new pond construction. Single or double lined is fine. If you're going to do double lined, you have to have something conductive above, which is the puddle of water, and something conductive below the primary. Um, you need, if you have geonet between, it's not going to work. It needs to be geonet, and then you got to fill that interstitial space. If there's not GeoNet or if there's a GCL, a GCL will work. There is some information out there that a GCL will not work with this test. We find leaks continually with GCL between, and it does work. It's just how you connect to that GCL to make sure it is energized. Some tanks will have the bottom will be surveyed, and then we would actually pick up the squeegee and go up and down the walls. And all kinds of liners are testable with this even conducted liner, as long as it's welded properly. So this slide is kind of a, a picture of how this works. And I, and I apologize for the, the childish look of this, of this slide. I'm an engineer. I'm not a graphic artist. But you have a water truck out on site. And that water truck, you have your water hose connected to it, and it goes right into the, the squeegee apparatus, which has... The electronics built right into it and he's pushing along this puddle this is the current on top of the liner in this puddle here the current outside is an earth ground through a copper rod or electrode out in the dirt what's keeping this puddle connected to this is of course all this bare liner so as he walks along the puddle falls into there completes these the circuit here and it's picked up in an audible tone. Very simple, very straightforward, not difficult. But here's what's great about this type of survey. Since everything is contained in a small area, you can actually do this test at the same time that they're putting on another layer in sequence. There's not a shock hazard. There's no danger to it. Even if they walked over and laid down in the puddle that we were pushing, there's, there's no danger there at all. So we can test at the same time they come back in line over literally right behind us. So there's no loss in time to the construction method. In this situation, we're testing what is now the secondary, and they're coming back and putting a fabric on top or a geotextile on top. So later they'll put on the primary. And this is all done in sequence, nothing slowing down. This is a typical leak you'd find. For a squeegee or a bare liner, it's under the flap. 
if you were just walking and looking, you wouldn't see that, but that puddle of water can go under the flaps, over the flaps, over wrinkles, and it'll detect these small leaks. Some of the advantages, uh, you don't have to flood the entire cell with water. If water is an issue at the location you're at, this is a good way to go. Like I said before, you can do it as construction progresses, 175,000 square feet per man per day, conductive or non-conductive, double lined or single. The limitations is you would not have a hydrostatic load as you would with the water survey on top to find tiny leaks. Now, not that you won't find tiny leaks with the bare liner method, you just don't have the benefit of the hydrostatic load to push the water through these holes to find. The biggest issue is, is the wrinkles. Um, if you don't have wrinkles, then everything's good. If you have small wrinkles, they can be pushed down by somebody stepping on them or just by the weight of the equipment itself will smash these wrinkles and take care of it. Leaks have been found on wrinkles because many times the ground, uh, the water beneath the liner is enough on the underside of the liner to connect to the hole and you can still find it. Now we'll get to water covered. The first thing you notice at this site, you see the water inside, you see the dirt outside, so you see the two areas of moisture above and below the liner, and then you see the isolated bare line around the perimeter. This is a perfect site for testing. It's deep, so we had to do a deep water method, but that's exactly how you want it to look. The picture on the right for deep water, this is anything over 30 inches deep. You have one guy on one side of the pond and another person on the other side of the pond and they pull a cable across over and over and over again, about two and a half feet apart. And whenever a leak is found, it gives an audible signal in their ear and they stop pulling. They pull till that signal is the highest and then they mark it on the side of the liner. These, these toes are, are marked so you can get very accurate to where the leak is. The picture on the left, this is not deep water, but it was done that way because of what was in the pond. It was a nasty solution that you didn't want on your skin. But I like this picture because it shows the drag marks of the, the electrode going back and forth along the pond. So you can see how close everything is being tested on that floor of the pond. This is a shallow water survey. These guys have fishing waders on, they're inside the pond or inside a tank, and they're testing pretty much every square inch of the lined area. What's great about this test is that your test about every 18 inches. So any leak at most is about nine inches from where you are. It's a super, super detailed test. These are the types for water surveys that could be done deep, shallow, the walls can be tested. Even if it's too deep to do the walls, we have what we call a plumb blob, and you drop it up and down the walls the same way the toe does, but on a vertical surface. So those are all things that can be tested with the water survey. Again, apologize for the picture, but it's the same way, the same idea. You have an electrode in the water above the liner, and you have an electrode in the moist earth ground outside. The only way these two sets of current will con connect to each other, complete the, the circuit, is through this leak right here. Now this, this survey is very sensitive. You don't have to be too close to find these leaks, but you do want to survey a very close pattern because the big leaks can show up sometimes 20, 30 feet away. And you could pass right over a small leak heading for the big one. So it's good to, to take your time, scan the entire surface area to find all the leaks, especially with water on the surface, even a small leak. And I know FGI has a calculator on their site. Even a small diameter leak can cause a huge amount of leakage. So you, want, you definitely want to find all of them in this case. This one was found on a weld. When you find them, we put sandbag or some weighted bag on top with the float on on, uh, on the surface 
So when it's drained for repair, you can find exactly where these are sitting and go ahead and take, uh, take care of all those leaks. The advantage is you have the hydrostatic load. You can find these small leaks in the seams and patches. It's extremely sensitive for finding small leaks, which is what you want when you're doing a water survey. And the pond can be in service. You can actually be using the pond and in service as long as it's not, if it's nasty, then you just do the tow survey and it keeps you from having to get in it, but it still is testable. The limitation on this one is the area that is underwater is being tested. The isolation perimeter on the top is not tested without the water on top. But of course, as you know, if the water went all the way to the top, then it would be grounded and then you would have another issue. Now the last method I'm gonna to cover today is the soil survey method. And this is, this is the bulk of what you see. And honestly, this is where the most damage is made in placing the soil cover. And this is that site I showed you earlier <clears throat> that had the rock right on top of the liner. This is done in new, new landfills. Uh, if it's an old one and there's already trash on top, you can't test it unless you remove the trash. Reason being is the trash is, is not a homogeneous mixture. There is all kinds of different stuff in there, uh, metals that will all <clears throat> grab the current away. And you want a nice smooth surface of all the same substrate below to test with. Um, mining heap leach pads are tested by this and landfill caps as well. Same way as the other two, but isolation is most important on this one. You have sand on top, you have earth ground, and you have your little isolation trench around the perimeter that keeps the current inside inside and it keeps them separated. So all this current will flow down into the leak and only the leak. So here's a little picture of a single line system. You have your power out to the side. You have your electrode in earth ground. You have your electrode on top. And this liner right here is isolated. And the guy's gonna come along and do the survey. So you have your subgrade. In this case, it's a secondary 60 mil HTPE geocomposite above it to protect it from the cover. You got 12 inches, up to three feet of cover material. Three feet's about standard, but I've seen it deeper and you can still find leaks, but three feet's a good standard depth to locate small, small leaks through. Your source inside with you and your earth ground outside. This earth ground does not have to be under the liner, it has to be outside of the liner for a single line system. When you do a double line system, it's a little different. You're still going to have your ground electrode, but this one has to be under the primary. Since the primary and the secondary are welded together, you have to have it in between that sandwich material and that interstitial space. You're going to have the wire that goes through the two GM membranes and connects to your electrode. You can even have a GCL above it. That's fine. It conducts. Some states, GCL only goes 15 foot up the slope. So that's as far as you'll be able to test. If there's nothing conductive between it, again, it's not testable. You'll have your primary geomembrane. And this is just a, an example, a cushion. And then you'll have some rock or soil or clay or sand. Your source electrode. But there's still one, one more thing missing on here. There's no isolation. You can test this site without the isolation, but it still won't be as good. Even though your ground is isolated to itself, the current still wants to leave and go to earth ground. So you need to go ahead and dig a trench there to isolate it. Again, testable without it, much better with it. On these sites, you can do a survey. As long as isolation is kept around the perimeter, you can do a soil survey while they're still building it. If it's a big enough site, and as, as long as the dozers and equipment stay away from the guys doing the survey, you can do them at the same time. As long as you have that meeting to make sure everybody knows where they are, 
<clears throat> excuse me, they're doable together. Because the idea that you can survey while construction is going on, and then when construction is done, the survey is finished the next day, there's no loss in time. So coordination and communication are big when these soil surveys or any leak survey is done to keep things moving forward and not slowed down. Rock can be tested. Rock is conductive, and it's usually the fines on the rock that allow this to really work the best. However, if you are doing rock and it's an arid type of environment, it's best to wet it down as the survey goes. We're not talking about a lot of water, we're talking about one to two percent um, just on the surface as the survey goes, and that'll give you the best results. Now, when you're doing a soil survey, you wanna know that you've tested everywhere and you don't have markings. So there's, there's multiple ways to do this and, and none of them are wrong. You can set up flags and string lines. If it's small enough, you can just set up flags. Um, this is usually done by the contractor doing the work or with the helper, or some people use GPS. There's, there's all different kinds of ways to do this, but the idea is long as everything is tested, and there's a way that they can show that everything was tested, that's what you want. You don't want big gaps in the data. Oh, I can't prove I tested this spot or I have tested this spot. You just wanna be able to see it to make sure everything was covered. So for a soil survey, there's a test called the sensitivity test uh, before you actually can take your data. And this is when you use ASTM to specify your job. This is the newest way that's in there. You test, you put a fake, what they call an artificial leak, or you can use an actual leak. It's six millimeter or a quarter inch buried beneath the soil on top of the line or close as you can get. And you take two lines on either side of it. I got one meter and two meters on each side of it. And based on how well it picks up in your data, how you can see it, determines the spacing at which you can take the rest of your data. Now, if you don't pick it up at all, there's also a ways that you have to take your data very closely so to make sure that you can find leaks, especially when you can't find this one. This test is easy to pass, it's easy to see, and here's what it looks like. On the right side is what the four lines would look like. <clears throat> when there's no leak, you would have a flat line. When there is a leak, you'll see it go up and it come down and then it flatten back out again. The closer you get to the leak, because the leak is right here, the closer you get to it, the higher that spike is. This is the new ASTM and how that looks. Now it used to be, it used to be more data lines. It used to be four on each side. And you could just see. You have a smooth curve, it's getting spikier, and then when you're right on it, it's, it's about as strong as it's gonna be. I like this test. It gives me a better idea of what I'm looking at at the site. Not every artificial leak that's checked will look like this because if it's done on sand or rock or clay, they'll have a different shape to them. So the best thing is when you take this data and you see what this looks like, and you go find another leak in your site, you're looking for this same type of look to it. So here's one site, <clears throat> and you look at the data, and you see leak 31. It's obvious, you see a high peak, you see a drop, you see it go back up. It's right there, it's, it's, you can't mistake it. But there's actually another leak, it's leak 30. And it's, it's pretty smooth, you might not see that if you're taking the data. What can be done simply is you enhance the data. You're not, you're not manipulating the data. You're not changing the data. You're just changing the way it's viewed on the Y axis. So you're changing that value. So it amplifies everything. Leak 31 is so big, it's off the screen now. But Leak 30 now has more of a representative leak of what you just found during your test. So now you go, what is this? And this data is looked at right then and there on the site. 
So it's, it's best to find all the leaks as you find them and expose them. Leak 31 was a little over an inch. Leak 30 was half inch. If you left this leak number 30, and that's, that's a lot of leaks for the site. If you left leak 30 in there and missed it because you did not take your data at a close enough spacing, it's, it's unknown how many half inch holes will be left in your site. You could tell who owns the site, look, we found 50 leaks in your site, but how many did you not find? And the best way to do that is to take your data on the closest spacing you can while still being efficient. So many surveys are done on a spacing such as this. This is a 10 foot by 10 foot spacing. ASTM says it's okay if the artificial leak is found on the, the furthest line out. So you have your 10 foot spacing. But then a step further is to take the vertical spacing as 10 foot as well. So if you equate that to how many data points are taken over an acre, that's only 400 data points. That may sound like a lot, um, but it's really not. The reason this is done is it's fast, it's economical, they can get less people out there, they can do it fast, they can get it done, they can find large leaks, they leave, you put trash on it, it's over. The bad side is small leaks can be missed, once trash is on it, it really is over. Now you're paying to treat it. It's, it's a whole nother problem. The closest spacing that you'll see out there is 3,080 data points per acre. This is on a five foot center. So this is per that ASTM. Even if it passed on the two lines on the outside, you're still taking it on the shorter ones. And you're not going 10 feet on the vertical, you're only going 44 inches. This equates to over 3,000 data points per acre, which is almost eight times more the data. It takes a little bit longer, but we're talking about we're talking about an extra day onto a five-day project <clears throat> to know that you found the small leaks. <clears throat> Even if you took it on 10-foot centers, but didn't go 10 foot in the vertical leak you're still at 1,540 data points per acre. That's almost four times as much as the 10 by 10. So the reason I'm pointing this out is if you have a site and it is large and you're testing and you want to find the big leaks, yes. But if you want to find the small leaks, the more data, the better picture you have. And as you find a leak, it's extremely important to if you find a leak, to dig it up and expose it because then that takes it out of the circuit. If you test or have them test the entire site and then go back and dig up all the leaks that you found, in this case, this is the 24th leak, you have 24 grounding spots in your cell. Now they are leaks, but they're still leaks that are grounding, which means they're leaks that is allowing current to go to them and not the other leaks that haven't been found yet. So it only makes sense that as the leaks are found, you expose them, you remove them from the circuit, and you let the remainder of that current go to the other leaks that are out there that you've not found yet. This is the best way to do it. It's the most accurate, and it will keep you from having to resurvey the site if you do it the other way. <clears throat> so in this cell, a large leak was found here is exposed and then it was tested around to make sure there was no other leaks. Then another leak was found, so that one was exposed. Then we tested around both of them, and they just kept popping up and popping up and popping up, till eventually they're all found, they're all exposed, and the survey will continue and not have to be retaken in that area again. So this is a lot of information, I know, and it's, and it's kind of hard to know how to get somebody out there that's gonna do it, um, with all these details in mind, but that's why I want you to know this information, to know what you're going to see, what you may not see, and be able to ask the right questions when these surveys are being done, or plan the site. So some specs, this top spec here, it's calling for three years of experience, which is great, but it's also saying they want 100,000 square feet tested 
and that qualifies you. But just so you know, 100,000 square feet um, can be done in about four hours. It's a little over two acres. When you can test four acres in a day, do you want somebody coming to your site that has worked for four hours doing something and they're gonna test the whole site just because the spec says that they're, they pass. There's some other specs out there that are much higher. We went from 100,000 square feet to 5 million square feet. This seems like a lot, yes, but if the three years matches, you will test easily 5 million square feet in three years. That, that will be done probably in the first year or the first year and a half. So that's still not a whole lot of experience of doing something for a year and a half, but that's far greater than the 100,000. If you want specs, there's plenty of specs out there. Just look for the look for the, the numbers that make more sense to match what you're having to test. Now here's, I'm, I have to show you some pictures of leaks. This just goes with what we do. These are some dozer tracks. Uh, in this case, he drove off his lift that he was driving on and poked holes through the liner. This was a cardboard depth gauge that they were using when they pushed so they could see where the depth was good and they would pull it out. This one I forgot to pull it out and it made a cookie cutter size hole in the ground. This is a texture GM membrane. You can't even see the leak, but where it's pointed at, it's a little quarter inch or a little eighth inch leak down there. This one has GCL underneath it. GCL does a good job plugging up the hole, but GCL is still conductive, so we can still be located by leak location surveys. This is a large leak. This is me with my pre-COVID-19 beard, and you can see how large that leak is. Uh, it's quite a good size hole. You know the, the dozer operator knew he did it, but he went in and covered it up with dirt about four feet here, thinking it wouldn't be exposed. This is a slit and a textured liner, 18 inches of sand. This one's pretty small as well. This is a double line system, and your conductive material on top is the P-Ravel. Then you have a fabric, and then you have the liner, and in between the liner was a geonet. Geonet's obviously not conductive, so they filled the interstitial with water. So what happens when you find a leak and you pull the P-Gravel off and the fabric out of the way, all that pressure releases, out comes the water, there's a little life slit right there in the liner. The advantages of soil covered, it's the only one available to detect construction damage under cover material. It's the best one for this or any other environmentally sensitive covered sites. The only limitation is you have to have the moisture above and below the liner to do the test. And if it's freezing, and I can't get into this today, if you have freezing temperatures and the ground is frozen, the test will not work because the frozen ground acts like an insulator and will not conduct the uh, current properly. Some of the takeaways, um, like I said before, best method for construction damage. Uh, construction damage is much greater liner performance issue than seam failures. Seams are, are being done well, especially when they're done in factories. These seams are essentially a non-issue. What we're looking for in leak surveys is construction damage. And it's it's been around for almost three decades now. So it's not it's not new, it may be new to some, but it's been tested for quite a while. So some of these things I'm talking about have been learned over the years. And so you can use these to your advantage to know how to build the site properly so that you can find all the leaks that are out there. There's only nine states here in the US that currently have it. I think Ohio is the newest and New York just changed theirs, but that's not a whole lot. I'd like to see more, of course. Um, the best things, like I said, proper isolation of your site, moisture, a good survey grid spacing. If that's the only thing that you get out of this is that the spacing of your testing, it really needs to be close because leaks can be missed or looked over because they're going towards the bigger leaks. Can be freezing and you don't want any grounding things in the way. Get rid of the ground paths. Uh, steep slopes are not an issue, conductive or non-conductive. 
there are ways to test those if you can't walk on them because they're too steep, they can be tested. Conductive line, that could be a whole nother, whole nother webinar. As long as they're welded correctly, they are testable. And there are certain situations where they're beneficial to have for certain tests and others to where it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Just to give you an idea of the speed at some of these tests, bare liner is up to four acres a day. The water test, about two and a half, it's a little slower. Deep water, it's a little slower, about two. And soil surveys, depending on the spacing, can range two and a half. That's, that's a, a rough site, not good moisture, not good isolation, horrible weather. Things are going pretty rough. But when things are moving smooth, it can be much, much quicker. So depending on how sensitive you can you can get your equipment. A cost, of course, everybody needs to know cost. It's it's a site different each site you go to, but as a baseline on a 10 acre site, if a bare liner survey was one, you can see how the different types of surveys are just a little bit larger than that. But overall, it's about a half to one percent of the entire pro, uh, cost of the project. So it's it's a very low cost for something that is meant to contain something and it can only contain it if there's no leaks. So this is a great final check at a very inexpensive cost. And that is it. I think at this point we will open it up for questions. Great, Matt. Thanks for a great presentation. And we have a, a lot of questions, so let me get to it. Uh, I won't even be able to ask my questions, but I'll ask my questions during our podcast tomorrow. And if we don't get to your questions today, please send us more questions after the webinar. You should receive a webinar survey that will be sent to you. Please, if you have additional questions, send them. And I'm going to conduct a podcast tomorrow with Matt. Uh, so, Matt, I'll save my questions. Let me just start. Uh, with some that I've received. First, how steep a slope can you test with the water puddle method? So you can do a one-to-one -one slope, which is a vertical wall with a water puddle, but you're not gonna be walking it because of course we're not Spider-Man. So there are things that we connect to it so we can pull it up and down the wall. Typically the steepest we do is a three-to-one slope, sometimes a two-to-one if it's textured. Outside of that, we're not gonna walk it because of possible tripping and falling and hurting ourselves. So you're gonna wanna have some apparatus to pull it. And that's that's the only way you're gonna do anything steeper. Yep. Uh, how does the technician control where, where they are performing the test and obtaining complete coverage? Again, I think you lay out a grid, but basically I think the question is, how does the technician control where they are? If this is for the soil survey, <clears throat> you have the grid, but you also have poke marks in the ground. When the when the um, soil survey goes through and takes a measurement, you have these little indentions in the ground, whether it's rock or sand. And you can see if you have these little indentations, it'll go about two inches, three inches into the soil. You'll see that you've tested everywhere if you want to check the person taking the data. But GPS is good. We have GPS. We mark the we mark the perimeter and we make sure we've taken everything in there. But there, there are ways that you can make sure they've tested everything. Okay. Uh, can you do a water covered geomembrane survey with a dam or, or is it too deep? Or if you can, how, how deep can you have water in the reservoir? So depth is a, is a non-issue. You can go as deep as you need to. Our equipment just needs to be longer and longer to go to that depth. It's, it's all connected via wire and through a headset. So when a leak is found, we hear it. So the, the depth is not a problem. My bigger concern would be the dam. If it's not lined, then that's a very large leak. But if it is lined, it is testable on that backside. We have tested a dam in China recently and uh, it is doable and depth is, it's just a lot of pulling and a lot of heavy, heavy work, but it's it's definitely doable. Depth is not an option, not a problem. Okay. Um, this person intends to place a new geomembrane over an existing geomembrane, so it'll be geomembrane to geomembrane contact. 
what is required to test this situation if it can be tested it can be tested and what i will say the best thing you can do if possible is to pull out that old gym membrane there are people that do this that is their only job and they can pull it out very quick if you're going to leave it and put geomembrane right on top of geomembrane it's hard to get moisture or something conducted between those two liners so you got to hope that that leak goes through both of those liners to find it what a lot of people will do is take the old geomembrane and cut it up make a lot of slits a lot of damage all over it so it's almost like a like a colander and then they'll put the new liner on top that does help because again the idea is to have something conductive beneath it and when you put a non-conductive surface right against the non-conductive you're looking for leaks to go through both liners so i would say take it out yeah or could they basically spray water on top of the first geo membrane if they want to keep it and then put the new one on top yeah and let, i think it'd be better in that case to put some kind of spacing between the two liners so that water would stay between them oh, okay all right the astm method for soil survey is that the same as the water method astm test method or are there two different methods that's the same 7007 is the same and it really covers it covers covered liners so water and soil is all mixed into that it's not two separate ones okay um matt here's a couple that are, have specific reference to your slides um slide number 40 if you could get there okay uh slide number 40 would the top liner contain a leak as well spike in the line in the liner can you test landfill sli side slopes I, I think yeah okay I, I got i caught the second half uh, side slopes can be tested and they should be tested uh, okay first part is um would the top liner contain a leak as well I guess he he was talking about leak thirty one and thirty. Uh, was there was there two geo membranes here? This side, no, there wasn't. Okay, was single lined. Okay, all right. So maybe uh, all right. Let's go on. Um, we talked about landfill slopes. Uh, slide number forty six. What is the recommended amount of area? should be exposed when a leak is found at minimum you want to have it large enough for the repair crew to get in there so i would say three foot by three foot even better if you could do 10 foot by 10 foot um, somewhere in between there between three and ten that not only exposes the leak so they can do the best repair but that also opens up the area around it to find other holes you don't want to go much bigger than that because then you may expose some holes that you can't visibly see so there is there is a trade-off there you want it big enough to be repaired but not so big that you expose 10 pinholes that you won't be able to detect now that there's not cover material on them yeah so that's, that's a good question though yeah can you conduct leak surveys during rainy weather yes as long as it's not uh there's no lightning close by, you can, but not a downpour. So we're talking a light rain sprinkle is okay. Is when it starts to rain too hard, then the the exposed strip of liner around the edge starts getting streams of water on it. And that's just as good as a grounding situation. So sprinkles are okay. No lightning's great, but nothing too heavy. Okay. Matt, at the end of your presentation, I think it was around slide 60, you had rates of testing some acres per day or something like that. Could you put that back on the screen? Because there are a number of questions about what are the testing rates that you can perform. Ah, that, there it is. Back up. Speed of the cost? No, rates. 60. Yeah, 61. Okay, so on the screen are testing rates. There are a number of questions about how fast they are. So let me go on. Um, can leak location survey test a secondary geomembrane under six 
millimeters of clay and 200 millimeters of sand or of sand or stone it can yeah all right but okay uh please discuss the difference between astm d7002 and the new method 8265 so 8265 is is a new astm that just came out about a year ago and uh, it has some further requirements on it when you specify it. Um, it talks about actual leakage of holes. So it wants a lot of moisture on the site at that time when you're testing. Moisture is needed to test, but when you have too much, um, it can cause problems, especially when you're doing a soil survey. And that's that can be an issue. It can tend to the, that spike, instead of being a high spike, when you put too much water, it almost, it flattens it out because it makes that leak from this area here, it makes it look bigger because now it's flooded with water. And the more water you have when it's too high will flatten that leak out so much that you might not detect it. And so in my opinion, I think 8265 has some issues with it because it's so new that need to be worked out. Okay. Uh, is there any thickness limitation for the soil cover that goes over the geosynthetics? In other words, it's usually 12, usually typical to 12 to 18 inches, but can it be much thicker, thicker than that? I would say anything over four to five feet is, um, is getting pretty, pretty deep. Uh, we've okay. found stuff under 10 feet, but you're probably not going to find everything. So I would keep it under five for sure. Right. Great. Under five. Um, this is a long one. Uh, let me just see if this will work. If not, we can move on. For a situation where a landfill has a protective cover installed within it and an exposed geosynthetic perimeter berm, which doubles as an isolation trench, would it be better to perform a soil survey within the landfill and then bare liner survey on the berm to confirm that all the geosynthetics are leak free. That might be a little too complicated. Maybe. Anyways. Yeah, that that berm. If you're if you're doing a, a bare liner test on that berm, and if the water runs down into the soil covered area, and there is a leak in that soil covered area, it'll it'll cause the equipment to peg out. Um, so. Ideally, when you do a bare liner test, you want that one to be before the soil. So when they do place the soil, you test that one later. So you know that there's no leaks in there. Yeah. In a perfect world, if you had no leaks in the soil covered area and then you did a bare liner, even if the water leaked into the soil, you probably wouldn't hear a leak because there's no leaks in there and then it would be okay. But that's a, that's a gamble. When performing leak location survey while construction is ongoing, as you illustrated, does the area where the dozers are working need to be fully isolated? It does. So they'll come in with a ramp that they'll make and then they'll come back and cut it out behind themselves. There are ways to weld an extra piece of liner there so that kind of sticks up between the pieces of dirt and they can drive over it. So there are things you can do to keep the ramp in but to still keep it isolated. But to answer your question, it, it does need to be isolated. Right, yeah. Um, does shallow groundwater affect the current or circuit that's going below the geo, geosynthetics? It, adding moisture by, by there being groundwater, um, it doesn't affect the way leak location surveys are done but it does it does obviously affect the site with groundwater in there pushing up from the underside it it can cause issues of course but for us it's it's not a problem yeah um for the bare liner survey does the source have to be in direct contact with the geo membrane or can a geotextile geocomposite uh, be present atop the geo membrane it has to be right on top of the liner. No composite, no liner on top of that. No, no fabric on top of that. Right. So basically, bare liner means bare liner, or actually, it should say bare geo membrane, right? Okay. Right. right. Uh, yeah, let's see. 
uh, we talked about steep slopes. Um, are there cost benefits to locating leaks using a conductive geomembrane? So I could I could answer this question the best way I know how um, without getting into too much detail. Conductive liner is best on a double line system on the slopes, primary only. That's the best use of it. As to why I would have to go into a much further explanation, but most times what can be tested conductive can be contested with just plain liner. Yeah. Um, do you recommend the contractor placing a hole, and usually it's like a push pin type hole, to see if the leak location can find the hole before starting? Yeah, that's that's okay. And there's actually a kind of a guide on the how to do that. The guide is not to make it easier for the contractor to find it, but there are ways that if you stuck a hole, say, on the very edge of the dirt, right next to where it's isolated, to where they could not survey on either side of that hole, it might not be um, detected. Or if they put the hole in there 30 minutes before you show up and there's no moisture there because it has to be put in similar to the way an actual leak would occur. And if it's done that way, it will be easily detectable. Okay. Um, how about leak locating a secondary liner that is already covered by the primary geomembrane and approximately 200 millimeters of stone. So that's uh, probably about eight or so inches of leak, leak collection stone above it. So if it's a double line system and you want to find leaks through the secondary, but it's already covered with the primary, you, you, can't, you can't test the secondary. There's no way to do that. Um, you have to look through leaks through the primary and secondary. Um, and if there's a leak in the primary, say on quadrant one, but then quadrant three on the secondary, the leak will show up where it is in the primary. It'll come through, go over. You, you won't be able to detect it. You might right. know something's there, but you can't tell where. Right. Right. Even if there's, say, a witness zone or a geocomposite between primary and secondary, you still really wouldn't know where the secondary one, it's just going to come through the primary. Right, because you can't physically get in between the liners to take the data. Right, okay. Um, all right, we're, uh, oh, we're at 108. Um, there are a few more here, uh, Matt. Uh, I think I'll save these for our podcast tomorrow morning. I encourage everybody to send additional questions. And if I didn't get to your question, I, I will get to it tomorrow in the podcast. You will get a survey uh, shortly after this webinar and you can send us additional questions. Okay, uh, before we end, uh, here's contact information for Matt and me if you have questions or want to send me the questions directly. And the next slide shows our next webinar presentation is on post closure care of landfills. Jeremy, Jeremy Morris with Geosyntech Consultants is going to talk about alternatives to. Uh, post-closure care and uh, the 30-year time period. So that's on Tuesday, May 19th, 2020 at noon Central Time. Our last slide is uh, some of the information that's available on the FGI website and the online PDH program is where you can go back and look at all the webinars we've offered. Watch a webinar and you'll get a PDH letter afterwards. We've started a new video podcast series. These are very short videos, sort of like the testing videos that I've recorded. And um, these complement our just audio podcast. And there's a lot of other technical information on our website. I encourage you to visit it. So uh, thanks again to Matt Chemnitz of Leak Location Services, Inc. for an excellent webinar and joining us from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for doing this. Is uh, very informative. Thanks so much for having me. I was glad to do it. Great. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you uh, next month for post-closure care of landfills. Thank you. <laughs>